If there's one thing I receive the most questions and emails about, it's queries regarding the tools I use. That and asking to be my apprentice. One of those questions being a bit more difficult to answer. So this video will be focused on five turning tools, which these days I can't work without. Although their application does extend beyond just turning pots. So the day before I threw a batch of pieces with the stoneware mixture compiled from a few different sources of reclaim, resulting in a slightly darker body that had a bit more tooth to it, grog from previously throwing what's intended to be a hand-building body, which is incredibly coarse and grainy. At the end of the day, the pots were firm enough that I could flip them over onto their rims, and I left them like this with a sheet of plastic slung over them overnight, and by the following morning they were practically perfect to trim, save for a few damp patches in the pots with thicker feet. For each of these pieces, apart from the two taller vases on the left, I've thrown them with ample material in the bottom. This way they can be trimmed to have lovely tall feet, which has sort of become a characteristic of my work. So for this process, I'm going to be talking about five different types of tools, which I just can't live without. And I should start by saying that this isn't a sponsored video in any way. Potters tend to love tools and hopefully this sheds some light on where I get mine. So I will include some links where I can in the description below. I'll begin with this, a spinner, which I also have to preface with the fact that the maker of these has now retired from producing them. Richard Carter, a potter and engineer who developed these with my help. So I have a whole stash of different sorts, prototypes, which include spinners made from various materials and of different sizes too. This is a tool that I never knew I needed until I started to use them. Essentially though, they're an object you place on top of the pot you're turning, through which you can apply considerable downward pressure to hold the pot in place. Richard's spinners had a ball bearing that separated the white part from the black part, which means your fingertips aren't rubbing against the abrasive clay as you trim. And as your digits also remain stationary, as there's nothing rubbing against them, everything feels a bit more stable and secure. With that being said, you don't have to use something fancy. For instance, this is the bottle cap I used for the entirety of my apprenticeship in Japan, which was so useful as the clay I was using out there was incredibly sharp and coarse. And this has a nice smooth top so I could push down easily through it. The second function of a spinner is for when you're turning pots that have a very thin base as it distributes the downward pressure across the entire bottom as opposed to it all being focused in one spot, which can happen when you use only your fingertips. Think of lying down spread out on a sheet of thin ice as opposed to standing still in one spot. This was the second spinner I moved onto. It's a piece from an old iMac computer. It held the screen component onto the swiveling base. I took the machine apart years ago and kept a few components and this one proved very useful as the top was smooth and there was a small divot a finger could easily sink into. The only thing it lacked were any spinning components. These very simple spinners from Diamond Core Tools have the same divot in the middle a finger can rest in. They come in various sizes and have useful measurements around the outside. But again, the plastic twists and rubs against you as you're using them, which if you are trimming all day long can leave your skin rather red and raw. So that's spinners. They all more or less do the same job. Some spin, some are stationary. And over the past two or three years, they've become a bit more popular, which means they're relatively easy to find. Although sadly, not these ones made by Richard Carter. The last thing regarding spinners is rather funny. For a long time, I wanted to ask Richard to make me one like this with a long handle so that it could be inserted inside a vase and pinned down, useful for when you need to burnish the rims of pots at the very end of the process, like so, which I sometimes need to do. I've never told him about this idea, nor have I ever met him. But a few months ago, he came to one of the literary festivals I was speaking at. And lo and behold, he pulled this out of his bag as a gift, which is just crazy as presumably it watched my videos and identified the fact that a tool like this could be useful. So thank you, Richard. And I'm genuinely sorry to the rest of you as he no longer makes these, which means I've just sent those of you who are interested on a wild goose chase of sorts. The next tool is one you see me use and speak about all the time, so I won't go into too much detail about it. Essentially, it's a trimming tool with a tungsten carbide tip, and it's this particular shape which I find so useful. You'll find it called a hook blade or a seven, and there's a few people out there these days who produce them. The flat shape of the blade is so useful for the style of pots I make, as they tend to be constructed from numerous straight planes, creating geometric angular forms. They're tremendously sharp, keep their edge, but tungsten as a composite, as it's almost like ceramic, is incredibly brittle. Next are these metal kidneys and ribs. They can be called scrapers too, I suppose, similar to those used by woodworkers. Essentially, I use these to finish the surface of my pots, as often the tungsten carbide blades leave quite ripped, ragged surfaces. So I use these to scrape them smooth, but I also use them like guides to ensure that certain parts of my pots are perfectly flat or have good curves in them, such as in a bowl. 
I have a whole collection of ribs in different shapes and sizes, and they are just such a versatile tool. They can do so much, and normally they cost practically nothing. Next, there's this sticky pad by Diamond Core Tools. You can also use chamois leather and other materials to do roughly the same job, but essentially it creates a surface onto which a pot will stick and hold, which can in some circumstances make trimming easier. Although there's certainly a knack to using one of these, and there can be quite a steep learning curve too, but I find myself using this all the time when I'm trimming weird shapes or just need to stick something to the wheel, like a polishing pad or a bucket of glaze. There's tons of uses for them. Now, the last thing is this mirror. I like this one from Ikea, as it's relatively large and I can angle it both forwards and backwards, depending on the shape and size of the pot I'm making. I can look into this mirror to see the perfect side view of the pot, whereas without it, if I'm looking down from above, the shape of the vessel is obviously quite skewed. In many cases, you see potters leaning awkwardly backward or even getting off the wheel to see this side view, but with a mirror positioned correctly, it's there all the time just by glancing up, and it helps so much in simply seeing the shape of your pot and how the tools you're using interact with them. In fact, I think more than any of the other tools I've mentioned, it's the mirror that I find most useful. Without it, it sort of feels like you're missing something, but of course it isn't crucial, as there are plenty of potters out there who make beautiful work without one. Now, with the tools listed, I'll spend the rest of this video discussing how I use them, together with some tips and tricks I've figured out over the years. The first thing is that these sticky pads can be quite difficult to stick down, despite their name, but I find getting them damp really helps. Not soaking, just a small amount of water normally does the job. The leather hot pots can then be placed onto this pad, and surprisingly they can still be tap centred, although you might find it easier to pick the bowl up and place it into the right position. Pots can also be centred the other way up, which I sometimes do to scrape the interior surface to make sure it's just right and has a lovely curve to it, but with a pot like this, if the base is too narrow, it will easily just tip over to one side. If I was trimming dozens of bowls and pushing my fingers against the coarse base of each, it can begin to wear away the skin on the ends of your fingertips. Plus, the twisting motion of the clay obviously has an effect on how easily you can push down to keep the pot in place. So I find it easier to use a spinner like this, which I tap center in place, although you don't have to necessarily center it perfectly. But again, the more stable the hand pushing down is, the easier it is to keep the hand consistently in place. And from this point, with the rim stuck against the tacky plastic of the sticky pad, and with the spinner on top I can exert rather a lot of pressure through, it's quite remarkable how well the pot stays in place. Essentially, the pad stops me from having to use three lumps of soft clay pressed around the rim, but at the same time it's worth mentioning that this doesn't save tons of time. It will though if you're trimming tons of pots, say 20 to 100 pieces, as eliminating the need to create three lugs of clay and pressing them around the rim over and over again will save you rather a lot of time in the long run. In the short term though, it can just help make things a little less fussy, although as there aren't any pieces of clay supporting and holding the pot in place, when things do go wrong, it tends to be worse. As without the small braces or any of those supports, the pot, if it comes off center when you're spinning the wheel, will just fly off. Here's an instance of using one of those flat metal kidneys to scrape over the exterior surface to neaten up the shape and sure up the lines. Now, throughout this entire process, this is my view in the mirror, and whereas from above the foot looked kind of straight, it was in fact still rather sloped, but it's an easy thing to catch and fix with the mirror. When first beginning to use one, it can feel strange, glancing up and seeing your hands at work. I suppose it's similar to looking in the rear view mirror whilst you're continuing to drive. At the start, you might not feel like you're fully in control, but with time it becomes natural, and sometimes when I'm throwing or trimming a shape I'm really familiar with, I find myself watching the entire process through the mirror. I suppose you don't want to become too reliant on it, as there are times when I've had to do public demonstrations and suddenly I'm missing this very important sense, this additional way of looking at the pot, and it always takes some time to adjust. Here's an example of using one of the correct shaped ribs for scraping clean the interior shape of this bowl. Of course it helps if you get this right at the throwing stage, but that doesn't always happen, and sometimes you might not notice a small irregularity until this leather hard stage. So there's absolutely no harm in fixing the interior shape if it needs it. Some pots though, don't work being trimmed on the mat. This pot, for example, when I turn it, the pressure I exert won't be pushing it down, Instead, it'll be from the sides, which means if you are trimming close to the top of the pot, like I intend to, the vessel will just be constantly tipped over. So instead, I attach it to the wheel the way I always do, by placing it on some slip that's brushed onto the wheel head 
tap centering it and then pressing a plastic kidney into the bottom to seal it tight. And whilst this does make a join that's more secure, it's definitely a bit more convoluted than using the sticky pad. Straight sections like this call for a straight blade, although if you are making curved pots, especially those with concave sections on the outside, then it's definitely worth using a trimmer with a curved blade as compared to a straight one. I guess when it comes to trimming and finishing your own work, you want a set of tools that matches the pots you make and at the same time you want to be comfortable using them. I must have trimmed thousands and thousands of pots with this particular blade, so I know it inside out, whereas if you give me a different shape, there's a good chance I probably won't be as confident with it. I think the best advice I can give when it comes to using turning tools is to get comfortable using a small selection of blades, rather than using a dozen different shapes which you're constantly switching between. This tool is probably a bit more versatile than you might imagine. There's the tip of the blade, the flat edge at the top, and the corner section too, which is wonderful for really gouging into the clay, like so, in order to remove a lot of material at once. I then switch back to one of these metal ribs to scrape over the turning marks that were left. If you're a maker who prefers to leave the turning marks more prominent, then of course you don't have to do this. It's a combination really of all these tools, the spinner, the rib, the pad, the mirror, and my favorite trimming tool that makes this part of the process so enjoyable for me. The lip of this pot has been rubbing against the metal wheel head, leaving it a tiny bit rough and scratchy in places. Normally, to compress and burnish the rim like this, at this stage, I'd have to secure the pot in place with three pieces of clay, which means potentially deforming and marking the lowest portion of the pot. But with this spinner, I can easily pin the pot in place and compress the rim without having to fuss around with lumps of clay and working in a really delicate manner as I don't want to tip the pot over to one side. But the spinner eliminates all of that. And once again, with a pot like this, where the angular shape is so important, it's the mirror that really lets me see what I'm doing. There are also cases where the spinners span the gap at the top, such as here, where I've already trimmed a hollow in the foot, meaning I can no longer use my fingertips to press down from on top with, but a spinner solves that. As for those diamond core tools spinners, I tend to use them in those rare cases when I either need a really small spinner or a much larger one. But on the whole, like I mentioned earlier, I prefer those with the ball bearing in the middle, separating the two parts. So if you are looking to purchase a spinner, I really recommend those. With this clay being so grogged, if I trim close to the rim, many of the specks of sand are torn out of the rim, leaving these rough pock marks all the way around it. So again, this is another instance where I can place a spinner inside the pot to hold it down as I burnish and smooth the rim. As a side note, I really like this cup with its tall foot. I think it will look lovely with the new olive green glaze I've been using, which looks something like this. If you are a potter watching this video, I'd love to hear about those special tools that you use, as I'm always looking for ideas on how to improve this process, be it when throwing, trimming, or even glazing pots. For instance, I'm always a bit shocked that not very many potters actually use mirrors like this, so I'm sure if that's the case, there's certainly things I'm missing too, which could definitely make me either more efficient or improve the quality of my pots. As there's a chance I'll be using quite a thin glaze on these, scratch marks left in the surface from the grog the body contains need to be dealt with if they are really prominent. And so to correct them, I smear soft clay into these grooves and then trim over them with a very blunt turning tool as this leaves a very burnished, smooth surface as compared to the tungsten carbide. I've always found that a potter's workshop is more interesting than the actual pots they create. It's a space where their creative mind has been unfurled and it isn't always neat and tidy, but it demonstrates how they think, how they problem solve, and how they work through ideas. And for me, what I find most fascinating is looking at the tools they use for the same processes I do. As at the end of the day, there isn't just one correct tool set that we should all aim for. Instead, it's much more personal, and it's a thing that's developed over years of practice. Just like when throwing pots, we all use our hands, of course, but different parts of them, a finger or a knuckle, the side of a thumb, or the pinch made between two fingers. We follow a rough choreography, but the tools we use to get to our endpoint differ from potter to potter. I hope you enjoy seeing those I've chosen to use. And as always, thank you so much for taking your time to watch, and I'll see you next week.